Hello? Now you can hear me. Okay, great. So good evening and welcome. Thank you for coming this evening. I think you're in for a delightful program with Mark this evening. Um, and so we're very happy that you're here. Um, the Wingate Museum of Art at Hendricks College occupies the traditional homelands of the Osage, Quapaw, and Caddo. We offer respect and gratitude to the indigenous peoples who have cared for the land over generations. You can read our full land acknowledgement on our website at wingatemuseum.org. Uh, I, I want to mention a couple of upcoming events that we're going to be having here at the museum, um, which the museum, if you don't know, is right next door, okay? And I encourage you to visit. Um, upcoming at the museum this month include our new film series, Cinema and the Changing American South, curated by our museum associate in film, Jasmine Chambly. It launches September 22nd with Minari, Lee Isaac Chung's loving portrayal, of his childhood in rural Arkansas. And there'll be a panel discussion following that screening. On September 29th, we'll be showing To Kill a Mockingbird, the cinematic classic of Harper Lee's 1960 best-selling book, also with a panel to follow. Reservations are required and can be made by emailing wingatemuseum at hendricks.org. And join us for our first, first Friday's event on October 1st from 5 to 7 p.m in the quad outside the museum. We'll have blues music by the Akeem Kemp Band, an artist demonstration by our current artist in residence, Anthony Sonnenberg, hands-on activities for adults and children, and lots of food and drinks. It's a family-friendly event, um, and it's open to the public, so please, no reservations required, so please join us. Uh, join our email list or follow us on social media to keep up with all the activities that we have going on. You can join the email list um, at our website, again, wingatemuseum at hendricks.org. Um, and now on to our speaker this evening, Mark Sloan. Mark has been involved in the photography community since the early 1980s in a variety of capacities. Artist, curator, educator, project director, video producer, author, publisher, and editor. While director and chief curator of the Halsey Institute of contemporary art from 1994 to 2020. Mark curated dozens of photography exhibitions and originated many important photographic projects, often funded by the National Endowment for the Arts and other national funders. He organized Yvonne Streetman's retrospective, which toured the US, and he curated the landmark exhibition, No Man's Land, Contemporary Photographers and Fragile Ecologies featuring despoiled landscapes around the globe, photographed by David Mizell, Emmett Gowan, and Edward Bertensky in 2004. Prior to his tenure at the Halsey Institute, Mark was executive director of the Light Factory in Charlotte, North Carolina, and associate director of San Francisco Camera Work. He holds an MFA in photography from Virginia Commonwealth University and has exhibited his own photographic work all over the world, including the Grand Palais in Paris and the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, DC. He has authored or co-authored 30 books, including many on photography. He most recently co-curated Southbound Photographs of and About the New South, which is currently on national tour and currently in our museum next door. The book for the project won the prestigious Alice Award in 2019. Sloan is currently an independent contemporary art curator and publishing consultant under the name Curioso and works with museums, galleries, publishers, and collectors around the world. Please join me in giving Mark a warm Hendrix welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, delighted to see you here. And I would like to take just a moment to uh, thank the staff of the Wingate Museum for uh, bringing me here and for bringing the exhibition here, for hanging it so exquisitely. I will tell you, it looks the best it's ever looked. Uh, and that's even, even better than it was at my own museum. So uh, my hat is off to the staff here. Um, the education staff and uh, everyone has been wonderful to work with. So uh, thank you to, to Wingate. Um, 
I would also like to just acknowledge that one of the artists from the exhibition, Timothy Hursley, is here in the audience tonight. Tim, would you stand up so people can see you? Ah, here he is. Arkansas's own. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be sure to... Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, and I'd also like to, I have a special uh, pair of guests in the audience here, uh, my Arkansas Mafia. Uh, uh, Louise Halsey and Stephen Driver have come in from Oxford, um, Arkansas, uh, near Ar Oxford. Ozark, sorry, Ozark, Ozark, sorry. Uh, and Louise Halsey is the daughter of William Halsey, the artist for whom the Halsey Institute was named and uh, that I ran for 26 years. And I got to meet uh, her father and her mother, uh, who were both exquisite, extraordinary artists and people. And um, they really changed my life and the way I think about art. And uh, they're role models for my wife and myself uh, for living uh, the, the, a life in the arts. So anyway, I'm delighted to have you all here. Thank you for coming. So what I thought I would do tonight is to give a little bit of an overview of um, my, the project, uh, if I can pull it up on the screen. Um, you get to see my cat. Um, I, um, this was a project that was four years in gestation from concept to execution. and. Um, it received funding from a variety of sources, uh, including the National Endowment for the Arts and Garden and Gun Magazine, uh, as well as um, many foundations and other individuals. So uh, why Southbound and why this exhibition? Uh, the project is uh, predicated, my, my co-curator is a gentleman named Dr. Mark Long, who is a political scientist uh, more specifically, he is a political geographer from Ireland. And um, he, he and I were talking about notions of the South and Southerness. And one day he asked me, what is my definition of the South? And I had a very hard time describing it because I didn't, uh, and I'm sure most of you if, you, have, if you were faced with that question, is Texas the South? I mean, and then there's the question of Florida. Well, the further South you go, the further North you go. And, I mean, there, there are some wor uh, wonky things about the American South. Uh, and where do you draw the line and why? And so Mark and I started looking at photographs from the South. And uh, we told our friends and um, colleagues and artists and writers and scholars that we were working on this project and we'd like them to nominate artists for us to consider. And we received over 400 nominations. and. Uh, in that, we fairly quickly narrowed it down when we were drinking Guinness and eating pizza. Um, and one of the things we came to was that we wanted to do a show of long-form documentary work. Long-form simply meaning uh, they're, just, they're not parachuting in and leaving. They're, they're um, coming to an area and making photographs. They have a sustained engagement with a subject or multiple subjects in the American South. Um, and we wanted to get as broad a diversity of artists as we could in terms of race, gender, uh, LGBTQ+, plus, um, uh, political spectrum, economic spectrum, all of that. And we wanted their images to reflect all of that. So we wanted a really cross-sectional view of the New South. And our, uh, what was the animating factor was the fact that uh, there's so many iconic images of the American South that I don't, I don't even need to pull up here. I actually prepared a PowerPoint, but PowerPoints are deadly, so um, I don't want to do that. don't want to bore you, but, you know, the Moonlight and Magnolias pictures or the Civil War pictures or uh, Walker Evans photographs of downtrodden people uh, destitute during the Depression, these images have become a kind of shorthand for the American South. It's unfortunate, but it's... Um, the, the region has so much more, has always had so much more to offer than being defined purely by those narrow stereotypes. So we wanted to create an exhibition that would provide a new set of images for, and, and possibly a new set of narrative possibilities for the uh, imagining the South. So uh, I'm going to show you uh, 
as I said, we started with 400 artists and we intended to get it down to 40. That was our plan. And um, we weren't able to do that. Uh, you may be uh, familiar with the term drowning our little darlings, you know about that? So if you become very attached to a, uh, an image or a photographer or a piece of writing that you've written, uh, but you have to cut it, you have to edit something out, so you, gotta, you have to drown one of your darlings. Or, uh, so we ended up at 56 artists, and that was, even then, we were still having to cut out people that we really wanted to keep in the show. Um, but we, for, purely for the sake of, I don't think the Winget Museum could have fit one more photograph in there. No. 220 images in the exhibition, 275 in the book, 550 on this website. So this website I'm showing you is a dedicated standalone website just for the project. And you'll see that there's, on, for each artist that I click, there's a series of 10 images on the website. So each artist is represented by 10 images on the website. This is, happens to be the work of Susan Warsham, I'm just starting with, just randomly. Um, she is a waitress at a cafe in Richmond, Virginia, but an extraordinary color photographer. Those are persimmons, by the way. True Aid. How many of you remember that? Anybody have one of those when you were a kid? That was a southern thing in my... I grew up in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, so I'm a native southerner. Um, and I... Um, so I had, a, I had some bona fides for this. Um, but my Irish counterpart, not so much. Um, this is the work of Daniel Beltra. I'm not going to go over every artist, but I wanted to show you a select few. This is uh, the work of, from the uh, BP oil spill in the Gulf. And um, these are uh, photographs. It was not only the um, largest oil spill in world history, but it was also the largest chemical contamination of the ocean in history. The chemical dispersant that they used to put out the flames and to corral the oil um, bespoiled the water even more so than the oil. Beltra lives in uh, Madrid. So not all the photographers were from the American South, but they have to have had a project or sustained engagement with a subject in the South. But these have a kind of, I was describing to a group earlier today, they have a sort of terrible beauty. They're exquisitely beautiful to look at, but when you realize what they are of and about, it, it pulls the rug out from under you. Um, and it's very hard to get these images out of your head once you've seen them. Um, so many images I could show. Let's go to Sheila Pre Bright uh, is a photographer based in Atlanta, Georgia, who is the unofficial official photographer for the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, Black Lives Matter is a non-hierarchical organization they don't have leaders, they don't have officers, that kind of thing. Um, and they don't have an official photographer. Uh, but Sheila is at almost every one of their rallies, no matter where it is. And um, she's made this extraordinary body of work. And um, I uh, promote her work wherever I can because I think she's an extraordinary artist. You know, I've, I've seen a lot of protest photographs, and these are just among the best. And it's, uh, when you know the context of it, it's really quite something. And uh, they're riveting images. Uh, 
Um, if anyone has any questions at any time, I would like for you to blurt them out in uh, whatever way you'd like. I'm going to show you the work now of a, a duo. There is one collaborative duo in the, in the project, uh, Keith Calhoun and Chandra McCormick. They live in the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans and have lived there for 40-something years. And they have together documented the culture and folkways of uh, New Orleans. And they've also done a lot of images of prisoners from Angola and other places. Uh, and they've done all sorts of series, including ones on Mardi Gras Indians. You see one here. But what happened was their life's work was in a Tupperware or a series of Tupperware containers under their bed during Katrina. They evacuated. They, they went north and uh, Katrina hit and flooded their house. And it turns out those Tupperware bins that we all put our clothes in and stuff, they are not waterproof. Uh, they're not watertight. And their life's work got flooded. And so they were ready to throw away all their negatives, just throw it away. And their son said, no, wait, let's freeze them, and then we'll figure out what to do with them later. So they put them in a chest freezer and then brought them out 10 years later and started printing. And this is what they look like. Uh, so these were in the Venice Biennale and uh, represented the U.S. in that. But these are, in a sense, two slices of history. It's the you know, photograph of one of the second line bands, but it's also the cracking and chemical uh, effects um, of the emulsion being affected by the storm waters from Katrina. A baptism, appropriate. Yes, it, we, we've tried to select representational samples. So the, the book has five each, and the exhibition has four. Uh, so we, and the website has 10. So, but we went through the website and um, we pulled out the images that we felt best represented that artist. It was a difficult, this is again, one of those very difficult challenges. Um, but we did want to, um, make sure that everyone was uh, well represented. Um, this is a, an interesting story along with the images. This is the work of Thomas Daniel, who is, uh, he was a combat photographer in Vietnam. And uh, he did three tours of duty in Vietnam. And um, he photographed uh, all manner of uh, wartime scenes and um, he was exposed to Agent Orange and I'm sad to tell you that now he is suffering from three different kinds of cancer um, uh, and um, he is struggling but he uh, before he became ill he embedded himself with Confederate war reenactors in around Richmond and he traveled around with them and I don't know if you know about reenactors, but this is serious business. These people um, make their own clothing, generally. Um, they make their own buttons. They make their own shoes and belts. Um, and you can't be seen wearing, like, something from Target. You know, it's like you just can't do that. Um, so Thomas actually fashioned a uh, fake camera in which to house his real camera, but the fake camera looked like a historic, historically accurate uh, camera that would have been used during the Civil War. I could, I can't hear you. Sorry. Yes. Yes. So we could have done an entire exhibition. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, uh, 
I will tell you the number of images that we saw with the Confederate flag in it were astounding. That was, now, one thing I should mention is we only selected work that had been made, already in existence. We didn't commission any new work. We were using existing work. So we were at the mercy of what photographers gravitated to and what they photographed. And they often photograph Confederate flags. So um, that was a, an, just an interesting phenomenon. That monument there, that's on Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia. That monument's now down, as are all the monuments on Monument Avenue in Richmond. So, but it's interesting that a, a combat photographer from Vietnam would be photographing reenactors. Um, similarly, here's a, this is one of the other artists who photographed Civil War battlefields. This is Elliot Dudick. So if you look closely, you can actually see a Confederate flag flying. Uh, this is not a Confederate uh, battlefield. This is, a, this is just a swamp near Edisto in South Carolina. This just goes to show there are rednecks everywhere. It's hard to see, but maybe you can see uh, the Confederate flag paint uh, on the inside of the bridge up there. Okay. Um, again, we were looking for a variety of imagery. Oh, I do have to show you a hound dog photograph because it's a, it's a show about the South. So we do have a, in this series here, we do have a hound dog picture. But uh, this is a baptism done with a sprinkler. Can you see the water droplets? You know, it's a mass baptism. There are the hound dogs. Call in the hounds. So, and then this is one of those, this gives me the opportunity to say that we were looking for images that asked more questions than they answered. And this is one of those. Um, what the hell's going on here? So, ladies in period costume, outdoor air conditioner, fake dog and cat in the background. Uh, those, uh, lorry cranes in the background for unloading ships. This is in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, Hurricane Katrina. So we had, uh, oh, we considered about 20 or 25 photographers who, who had photographed after Katrina. And um, we kept seeing the same, um, what my colleague Mark called disaster porn images, uh, really the same images over and over again. Uh, but Mitch Epstein's work was categorically different. This is a photograph taken in Louisiana of what's called Cancer Alley. So uh, this is a beautiful alley of oak trees uh, with a chemical plant at the end. Now, Mary, you know this person in the photograph? I don't know her personally, but it's Martha Murphy. Who is a, an architect. And what's her connection to past Christian Mississippi, which is where? I have no idea. Okay, so she, that, that's where she is. 
that was the aftermath of Katrina. Uh, this is a coal power plant. Imagine having that in your backyard. Let's go out and grill. Again, trying to show the range and dynamic nature of the southern landscape. Uh, there's a photographer, Lisa Elmola, who is coming here. Uh, yes? Um, let's see. I somehow missed her pictures. I didn't mean to. Well, I'm going to show a little, a short video about her that I think you'll enjoy. Get to know her a little bit. We made 15 videos in conjunction with the exhibition. I got into this process because I wanted to be able to make my photographs from scratch. It's a process from the 1800s that uses this stuff called collodion and you pour it onto a plate and that is then sensitized in a silver nitrate bath. I, I like collodion when it gets older. I like it a little bit more contrasty and a little slower. Most people that do the process would be like, you know, why wouldn't you want like faster exposure? You know, collodion's already contrasty, but I don't know. It's just, it's just got more oomph, more punch, you know, when it's a little bit older. All right, so we're gonna let that sit in there for three minutes, and then the plate gets exposed and then developed all while the plate is wet. You know, it's, it's not like taking a snapshot where you just kind of bounce in and take a quick picture and run away. I mean, you really have to get to know a person when you're photographing them in this process. One of the fun unknown factors is branches and leaves and things will move while you're making the exposure. The exposures are usually pretty long. Also like, you know, a lot of this scene is in shadow. I'm gonna go ahead and try 15 seconds. Hold still. With the musicians that I photographed, I set it up so that I go visit them where they live. Um, I like to photograph them in their own homes. Um, where they're most comfortable. Janice Birchfield, she's, she's amazing. She's a force of nature. Probably about yay tall. And she is just the funniest, sweetest lady. And she plays the hell out of that washed up bass. The one of Matthew and Moses, it took seven or eight plates before both of them were still. Whenever I would get one still, the other one would move. That was a good amount of time that it took to get that plate, but it was worth it. But I've been kind of all over Appalachia photographing musicians. Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, Georgia, North Carolina. So if we're doing the photo nerd thing, we've got highlights, detail in the highlights, detail in the shadows. Sometimes when you're photographing people, you kind of just have to go with uh, whichever one's the best, and it's not always technically the best. But you can see the tonal difference from that plate to that plate is like pretty wildly different, eh? It's pretty nerdy. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't really know how they found me for this show, but I feel really honored that they did. <laughs> I feel like I've been hiding out for a while. Um, that gives you an idea of some of the, that's, that's an example of one of the videos, but let me just show you on this where you, on, under the tab watch, you can see um, these are 15 videos that we did. That's the one you just watched on Lisa. 
Um, but we have these little short, I don't know, three or four minute um, portraits of just a few of the artists. And you're going to ask me, Mary, how, how did we pick which artists to uh, highlight? Uh, it was really a, a difficult thing to, to do. And again, we wanted to try to find um, representative sampling of the artists in the show as much as we could. This is the work of a San Francisco-based photographer who's photographed in the American South, and he photographs intentional communities. So these are sometimes people who are back to the land people, um, religious um, groups, and that sort of thing. And um, he's photographed primarily in western North Carolina, Virginia, uh, Tennessee, and Kentucky. So a gentleman sleeping, uh, looking like he's right out of a Renaissance painting. This is a young Mennonite woman wearing a, a dress that either she or her mother made, presumably, uh, using camouflage material. Just kind of nice, you know, very feminine. And then this is the same young woman being shot how to, sh shown how to shoot a gun by her mother. This is an amazing picture, homeschooling. I love that brave new world. <laughs> yeah, the end is near. Those are uh, parts of deer soaking in the tub. And then that's where milk comes from. Was, we were, had the exhibition and a lot of parents use the occasion to show their children uh, in the exhibition, this is where milk comes from. And they said, no, no, milk comes from a carton and you get in the store. So that was just an interesting thing to observe in how we think about things like that. Um, this is the work of a Hong Kong-based photographer named Kyle Ford who photographs American tourist attractions um, and he has a whole body of work on the American South. This is the Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta. And here's the Ringling Brothers Circus. I believe this is in Florida somewhere. But you know now that the Ringling Brothers, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not even sure Ringling Brothers is still in business, but they no longer show animals anyway. Um, that's part of the circus past now. So this is a historical document. We caught the very tail end of it. This is um, Disney World. And then this is another historical document. Here we are at SeaWorld with Shamu and... Uh, his compatriots, I think they're, if you count them, I don't know how many, I think there's seven orcas, killer whales, in this photograph. And uh, they're no longer used uh, for entertainment of people either. So these are two images from this project that uh, are now time capsule images. This is a butterfly park. show you a couple more here just to um, this is Titus Higgins um, lives in Durham North Carolina and photographs uh, his neighbors this is a young man I think his name is Dontre and um, one of the aspects of this project was we commissioned the poet Nikki Finney to uh, select a series of images to write ekphrastic poems from Ekphrastic is just a fancy word for saying the poem is inspired by a visual stimuli. And so she chose this one as one of the four that she wrote for the book. 
and Nikki is going to be here uh, at Hendricks College in, how, when is that? October 6th. Do not, a virtual event. Do not miss it. She will take the top of your head off. She's a wonderful poet. So Titus um, does a lot of photographing at a place called the Inkwell, which is a tattoo parlor near his house. And um, he, and this woman ends up looking like a Madonna with the hubcap halo. Um, but he says that uh, in a way, the tattoo parlor is where all of humanity passes through at some point. So he spends a lot of time there. And we wanted to show the influx of the Latino community, Hispanic community in uh, the American South. So there, you'll see a lot of pictures in the exhibition and book um, demonstrating that trend. We did an educational outreach project where we put four of these artists out in the community to, um, to interact with local school kids and teach them how to photograph. And we bought 60 $1,000 camera, digital cameras and we rotated them among the, these different schools. Four artists and then we had a writer named Sunel Barnes who went out and taught people how to write oral histories, collect oral histories. The photographers taught the students, they were all high school students, how to photograph someone you don't know, how to walk up to someone and say, may I take your picture, and also with relatives, but with strangers as well. Um, this is Timothy Hursley's work. I'm gonna make stuff up about his work because he's here, I can do this. This is a cult headquarters in, uh, no, just kidding. Uh, this is a casket factory, or a, sorry, a, a funeral home showroom in Mississippi. Yep. Yeah. Okay, and um, notice that there is the detail of you are here in that, just so there's no mistaking. Now, I don't know if these are, we'll have to ask the artist because he's here. Um, I don't know if these two metal boxes are cut rate caskets, but they are sitting on top of a train table, I will point out. And this is another one of those that just asks more questions than it answers. Do you know what's, what these are? Um, it was a shop that said a funeral home in Vicksburg. Um, this is in the back room of this other photograph. Did you buy one of these? No. no. Okay. I was just curious. This is in Alabama, yes? Uh, uh, this is here in Arkansas. It is Arkansas. Uniforms? Yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful photograph, one of my favorite from the exhibition. And this is a ballpark, isn't this built by Rural Studios? From the Rural Studio, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And is this in Hale Co County? Uh, Hale County, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the same as this ballpark. Mm -hmm. 
So if you don't know about Rural Studio, I strongly recommend you look into it. And the founder of it was a gen gentleman named Samuel Mockby. And uh, you could, there's a movie on Netflix you can watch called S Citizen Architect, which is a really extraordinary movie. He was a MacArthur Award winning architect and he started this program. And um, he had the radical idea to say to his architecture students, let's design houses with and for people uh, who are going to be living in the house that we build. So instead of designing a bank building in Dubai, let's build low and no income, or let's build houses for low and no income people in rural Alabama. And so they interviewed the people who were going to be living in the house and what are your interests and oh, I'm into music. And so they designed the entire house for the music man. It's an amazing story. Um, and there should be more people like him in this world. This is all the, this is from the Rural Studio series too. And that's Rural Studio. Our only character sales on the Rural Studio mm -hmm. area of Mercer. Mm -hmm. These people were waiting for their new room mm -hmm. to, to build in which is just around the you know, town mm -hmm. hall. Caused many accidents, I would imagine. People driving into it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the helpful narration on that, Tim. Hope I didn't embarrass you too much. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm going to take you to Po Monkeys here. Uh, this is a juke joint. So, to point out that um, one of the things that we, we looked at the, the macro and the micro. And so from a, Mark Long and I, my co-curator and I, planned, we went on three different sojourns through the American South. And so we went up in through Virginia, North Carolina, uh, Tennessee. We went from uh, down into Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, um, and then um, up through uh, Western Mississippi and back. Anyway, we planned the trip that we went to Mississippi around being in Marigold, Mississippi, where Po Monkey's Juke Joint is, and it's only open on Thursday nights. So we made it. We went inside, and uh, it was an amazing experience, I will tell you. So that's the proprietor there, uh, Mr. Seabury, who unfortunately died just months after we were there. But it is, uh, people come from all over the world to this famed juke joint. And I'll show you, because I think it would be interesting for you to see, um, the little video we did on this to give you a sense of the... Um, uh, what it was like or, or what the place looks like on the inside and one of the things that was so extraordinary about it was that it um, didn't it, it looked like a Home Depot shed from the outside it was not large at all but when we walk through the doors there are two sets of doors that you walk through to get into the main hall of uh, Po Monkeys 
And when you get into the second room where the bar is and the DJ and the dance floor and the pool table, this what looks like a tiny, impossibly small little building on the outside is the size of Versailles on the inside. It was like a wormhole. So keep that in mind as you watch this. I was fascinated, still am, with the power of Willie Seabury, with his ability to, to create a place that people all over the world would want to come visit. And I was curious about how people come together and how they really enjoy each other's company and then move away. And so all of those things were part of what kept me coming out here. His father was Rabbit, his brothers all had animal nicknames as well, and so his became Monkey. He added the Poe as a little bit of a marketing ploy, I think, at one point, but he was definitely beloved and known as Poe Monkey. So the space opened up sometime in the early 60s and uh, was just like any other juke joint. It was a, primarily a place where the folks that worked the farm around here would gather. But you'd go through this door here, and then there'd be another door that you would have to go through. And then once you opened that door, the ceiling would feel like it was right on top of your head, and there were Christmas lights everywhere. There would be a pool table that had a definite lean, so the guys that won most of the games knew that the ball would slowly make its way that way, so they knew how to play the table. That room right there, uh, is where the kitchen was and his bedroom. This was his home also. And usually the people that arrived at seven often were tourists and they would usually leave by 10 and they would totally miss the magic. Uh, if you can make it to 10.30, the dance floor would start filling up. Prior to that, people would just kind of sit around and visit a little bit, but by 11 o'clock, the dance floor was almost every single Thursday night. It was filled with people that were dancing and by field it probably was 15 people but it felt like 1500 because it was so small. Here there'd be these really glorious couple of hours where you kind of would look around and go wow if the world could just be this way every day we'd have no problems anymore. And then midnight would come and we'd all go back to our corners and then you'd look about the work day on Friday morning and you'd still have those cultural norms that are just so layered in the South. I miss it. Now I miss it. He's one of the best businessmen I've, I've ever known in my life because he knew how to make you feel like you were the most important person in the room. Uh, and he also knew that if he could make you feel that way, you'd stay here longer, you'd buy more beer, and you'd come back. I'm proud of the photographs I made. I certainly can go through them now that I don't have an opportunity to photograph that anymore and say, oh, I should have done this, I should have done this, I wish I'd done this, I wish I'd done that. But mostly I just miss it. I just miss that group. I miss those Thursdays. So, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we, uh, oops, we um, worked with, uh, th this is a multi-layered project. Um, we commissioned a soundtrack from um, an ethnomusicologist named Jake Fussell, who was a product of the um, University of Mississippi's uh, Center for Southern Studies, and he studies Southern music. So, there's a two-hour soundtrack of contemporary Southern music on the website here, and these are the people. So there's Rihanna Giddens, Lucinda Williams, some of these names you've heard of, some you've never heard of. The Preacher's Kids, I doubt you've heard of. Uh, but there's uh, Lau Bamboo Harp, Mouth Harp, uh, Lil Wayne's, Lil Wayne's in there. Um, so 
Um, anyway, I'll just give you just a sampling of this. Just I'm going to jump around at the risk of making you dizzy. And there's a full description down below of how he selected all these. So I urge you to visit this website and just put on the soundtrack. You'll enjoy it. But we got Lonnie Holly. Also, uh, Lumbee Indian rap music on here. So a lot of things that are going to be very unfamiliar. Um, we also created a digital mapping environment, which is out on view in the um, uh, foyer of the museum. Um, and this, is, uh, this was a really challenging aspect of uh, our project in that we were interested in um, I hope this pulls up. It's, uh, it was a little finicky when I was trying to do it earlier today on the, with Wi-Fi. It's better with, uh, because it's GIS mapping, it's better with an um, a, a Ethernet connection. But this is, um, oops, see, this is what I mean. Sorry. Now I'm making you all sick. Sorry. The, this is the profusion of Confederate symbols in the American South. Um, and you can see that they are, th this is called a heat map, you're probably familiar with that term. Uh, so where, you, where it's red, uh, that is the greatest profusion of Confederate symbols. Um, if you want to see the African American population of the American South, this is uh, from the 2010 census. And that is, it's not that there are not African Americans in all parts of the country, but this is where they're concentrated. So, um, and then we looked at businesses with names that had the word Southern or Dixie or any kind of Southern flavored uh, name. But we found, we got some pings out in Southern California because there was Southern Garden Center or whatever. Uh, but we wanted to just look at that. And we looked at field crops. But we worked with a GIS specialist who helped us come up with all of this. And um, again, it adds another layer to the, to the project. So these are um, areas of cotton, peanuts, rice, sugar cane, and tobacco all together. But again, it shows how agricultural the American South is. Um, let me do the Confederate symbols one more time. Yeah, Th that's where Confederate symbols are um, concentrated. Um, anyway, then this is a combination of all of the, fusing all of the maps together uh, to show that there is in fact a place called the American South that is geographically and otherwise unique to the rest of the country. You couldn't do northbound, for example, and get away with it. So I urge you to spend some time on that if you have a chance. Uh, you can go on the website and read essays. So Mark Long and I wrote an essay. Eleanor Hartney, who is one of the 
uh, critics for Art in America, wrote a really beautiful essay about the project, and she highlights certain images uh, in her essay. Uh, similarly, you can, under read, you can go to, um, this is William Ferris, uh, who was the former director of the National Endowment for the Humanities. He wrote a, an amazing essay for us as well. And um, then we had a, an article written by John T. Edge, who is uh, the founder of the Southern Foodways Alliance. And you may ask, why would you have a, uh, he, he's a food writer, New York Times bestselling food writer. Many of you may know him as John T. Don't call him John. Um, but he um, is a very interesting writer in that he, he writes about race, but he, he tells you he's writing about rice. He said, you know, if, if you want to talk to someone about, if you want to have a conversation with someone about race, and you say that, they will run away from you because they don't want to talk about race. But if you want to say, you talk about rice, people talk about their grandmother's recipe or, you know, rice pudding or this or that or memories, food memories. And then he gets into talking about, well, you know, the rice was grown by enslaved people and that they brought the technology for this over with them. And he, so he, he manages to squeeze in a conversation about race, uh, but using food as the vehicle. So it's interesting, uh, interesting article. And the um, poems by Nikki Finney are here. These are the four images that she chose. And this one will break your heart. Though he, she used the image of the Gulf oil spill. And then she wrote a poem about the Emanuel AME massacre in Charleston. And it is one of the most powerful pieces of writing. I will not read it for you because I can't do it justice. She may read it here when she comes, or when she does her virtual visit. But um, that's really quite amazing. And then this just talks about the book. Um, yeah. But I wasn't finished with the artist. I did want to just show you the range of the project. And uh, I don't want to... Um, go on and on and be a drone, but is, is this interesting, especially for those of you who can't see the exhibition just now? This is, these are aerial photographs taken in Florida, near Lakeland, Florida, of a community that was designed and um, intended to be built, but right before the financial crash of 2008. So you wouldn't want to be this guy living here in this little model home, but... Um, the rest of those lots didn't sell, apparently. But this is how we live now, in case you didn't know. Again, going from the inside of Poe Monkeys, that kind of almost claustrophobic micro uh, experience to this bird's eye view. Sorry? Can I report? Yes. About Lucinda Bunnen. Lucinda Bunnen. Yes. Lucinda Bunnen. She is a really wonderful photographer out of Atlanta, Georgia, who is just an interesting character in addition to being a wonderful photographer. And she's been my friend for 30 something, 35 years. Um, she is, in addition to being a photographer, she is also a um, collector and a philanthropist. She's on the board of the High Museum of Art. She gave the High Museum uh, their photography, uh, the basis of their photography collection. I believe it was 5,000 images she gave. And she endowed the program. Um, she's traveled the world and photographed in Papua New Guinea and uh, all parts of Africa, and um, but she has spent a lot of time photographing the American South. And she's 92 and still photographing every, every day. 
She did a book in the 80s, I think, called Movers and Shakers of Georgia. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it had Bill Clinton in it. it or, uh, I don't know why he would have been in Georgia, but it had early or Jimmy Carter and all kinds of people. Uh, yeah. So uh, any other requests, if anyone has them, I'm happy to... Yeah. Rob Amberg, okay, yes, I do. Yes, he lives in uh, Madison County, North Carolina, and uh, he and he's he's an interesting character. Do you know him? Okay, he, yeah, he uh, he um, he's a New Yorker who, in the seventies. Moved from New York City to rural North Carolina, and he himself started living off the land and photographing his neighbors who were living off the land. Uh, it was a conversation. So uh, we. It was a matter of the, the image itself had to kind of let us know how big it needed to be. So the, I think the biggest ones in there are 30 by 40 inches, something like that. And any bigger than that would have been really difficult to transport for a traveling show. But some people, maybe Burke Uzzles are 50 by 60, I can't remember. He, he made small, yes. Well, he makes gelatin silver prints, and um, he prefers them small because of the richness and the lushness of that, and also the intimacy. He really prefers that. So I'll tell you a funny story about this I told earlier today, but uh, I saw this gentleman, this, this photograph, and I was talking to Rob about it, and I said, um, and he's got some metal and tattoos and stuff, and I said, oh, well, I wouldn't want him dating my daughter or something joking like that. I'm a flippant comment, which I shouldn't have said. But uh, he said, oh, he is dating my daughter. So, okay. Foot firmly in mouth. Uh, and there's some, uh, this is Gillian Laub. She photographed uh, uh, in, in Georgia, and she photographed a, what had been a segregated prom, and the students at the high school decided to integrate it. And um, she made a beautiful series of photographs about it, and she also made a film for HBO that won all kinds of awards. So she's a double threat, a photographer and videographer. How about Burke Uzzle? Burke Uzzle. Okay, Burke Uzzle. They all have stories, you see. Uh, So, Burke Uzzle is the youngest photographer in the history of Life magazine. So, he was hired at age 19 to work for Life magazine, which was, most of you don't know what that is, but it was a picture magazine back in the, back in the day. And then he worked for Magnum Photos, which is a big photo agency. Uh, he's now in his early 90s and lives in Wilson, North Carolina, near his hometown. He's an exquisite photographer. He also did the uh, cover image for the Woodstock album. He was at Woodstock. He claims to be the, have the only in-focus pictures at Woods, taken at Woodstock. He, he doesn't do drugs or alcohol, so. And he said all the other photographers, he, he was there, for, he only brought like 10 rolls of film, and it's a, I don't know how many, four-day festival or something, and he said uh, he ran out of film pretty quickly, but 
he would run into all these guys who had cameras and they were all too messed up to photograph. So he said, can I buy some film? And they just, here, have it, man. So he got another 20 rolls from people who gave him film. So. a jaunty little front yard, isn't it? In this one, it's really hard to tell. This is another one of those that asks more questions than it answers. Is it a dollhouse or is it, does it just look small? Um, those are crab pots for those of you who may not know what those are. Okay, other requests? There are stories about each one, as I say, I could, I will, t I will talk just briefly about Deborah Luster. These are photographs taken in Angola prison in Louisiana, and then I'll, I'll wrap this up. Um, these are photographs of prisoners enacting the Passion Play, which they do each spring, and they make their own costumes, they direct themselves and make their, own, their stage sets and props. This is Judas. incredible humanity in these photographs. So Deborah has been photographing in prisons since the 1980s. Um, shortly after her mother was killed by a contract hitman and uh, he was caught as was the shooter and the person who called for the hit. She had to sit through both court cases and uh, both gentlemen got, uh, gentlemen, both uh, of the accused got life sentences and um, she's spent the rest of her life since then photographing prisoners. And we all process our grief in different ways. Oh, zebra racing. We have to look at that. Because you didn't know you needed to see zebra racing tonight. See? I didn't make it up. You know, fresh gator meat. This is Tammy Mercure from New Orleans. This is taken at the Redneck Games. Enough said. And this is the poster for testosterone poisoning, I think. Anyway. Um, sorry? Okay. Yes, that's an amazing body of work. So, if you were a runaway enslaved person and you were on the Underground Railroad, uh, this is what you would have seen. So, uh, McNabales um, did the research and found out the pathways that the uh, enslaved people escaping would travel, and she photographed there at night. It's hard to see. Um, you, you really have to look at the photographs very closely, and when you do in the exhibition, you can get lost in them because they... Actually, the more your eye, like being in the dark, your eyes adjust, and the more you stand in front of it, the more you see. Really extraordinary. Sorry? They are stunning in the gallery. This, they're beautifully lit, and um, yeah. So this is does something that photography can uniquely do in that it provides a kind of. Um, opportunity to climb inside someone else's head. And um, 
provide us with privileged access to something that we would not ordinarily have a chance to see. Okay. While we're calling out hits, anybody else have, have any uh, from the hit parade that they'd like to see? I mean, there are 56, sorry? Shelby Adams. Okay, I have a long history with this man. Um, I gave this artist his first one-person show in 1985. I showed it, well, it was a two-person show with Doris Ullman and uh, black and white photographs of his friends and neighbors and relatives in, um, in and around Hazard, Kentucky, which is um, a, a town that is filled with Pentecostal churches and... Um, yeah, this is a, I think, 103-year-old lady. Ironically, that is the precise color scheme of my living room at home. So Shelby has been, uh, he's actually... Uh, received some criticism uh, from the press and from some certain writers who write about him and his work that his work is in some ways exploitive uh, of the of his subjects and what he says is and uh, in, in this grouping you don't really see much of the controversial images but uh, his black and white work he photographed um, uh, grown men wearing diapers and with no shirt on on the front porch and um, people with various um, health conditions. And what Shelby says is, uh, it's important for you to know these are my friends and relatives and um, family. And we do not, if we have a family member who has uh, uh, developmental disabilities or autism or something like that. We don't put them in an institution. We take care of our own. And so if you see them on the front porch, there's a reason, because we take care of them. So that sort of shuts people up when they, you know, talk about uh, that. And the fact that he is from this region and um, uh, that many of the people in the photographs are, uh, in fact, his family members or relatives. Um, I'll show one more, let's see, and then I'll try to wrap it up here. I know you're, oh boy, but who to pick? Um, hi, hi, hi. Well, I'll show you this. This is an unusual body of work. This is Sofia Valiente. And if I didn't tell you, and you just looked at these pictures, you would say, oh, those are nice portraits of people in houses. And, but when I tell you, that this is an entire village, uh, a community of uh, former sex offenders. Well, I say former, I don't know if they're former, or, but they're, they were incarcerated for being sex offenders, and they all have ankle bracelets on, which you can see in the photographs. And they're living in a halfway house, a community called Miracle Village in South Florida, and learning how to live on their own after life in prison. And um, if they can convince their social workers and others that they are okay and not a menace to society. They get to released into communities like yours and mine. Um, but Sophia, as a young woman, went there and um, made some extraordinary portraits of these gentlemen. So again, uh, the idea that photographers provide us that privileged access to communities that you or I would probably not even know existed uh, in the South uh, were it not for this project and were it not for this photographer's courage and um, dedication and relationships that they form with their subjects. Um, okay, I think that's it. Sorry? She, she is based, let's see, these are all taken in South Florida. I don't, I don't remember where she's based. Let's look. 
Um, we have their, everybody's bio here. Lives in Belle Glade, Florida. So there's all the stories that I'm telling you, or most of them, are on the website, so you can read about them. Uh, and they're also in the book. Yeah? Did you get much of that? How are the people from the people from the show, or how did you find them? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a good question. So we, uh, we did not have a call for submissions. We, we didn't go that route. And I have found in my 38 years in this field that if you do that, you end up making more enemies than friends. So we actually did it in a stealthy way, and we did it through the internet. And the artists, most of the artists, the 400 artists that we got in the initial uh, scoop had no idea we were even considering them for the project. So, and that's actually good, because we didn't want to be lobbied, we didn't want to be uh, bribed, we didn't want to be, <laughs> you know, um, and so we, we went about it. But well, well, one of the things, we, we talked to curators and museum directors, writers, scholars, photographers. Photographers ended up being one of the best sources for other photographers, because they knew some of the best people out there. And now, that idea of, of uh, working that way has a tendency to be like self-referential or something. And, and so we did things to break ourselves out of that box. And we would contact people. We went to um, uh, historically black colleges and university uh, professors. And we said, who do you know that's working in this way? And um, we, we worked with something called the um, uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm blank having a senior moment. but. Um, uh, we, we worked with several different organizations and institutions that were dedicated to uh, LGBTQ plus uh, rights and uh, artists. And so we have quite a few artists who, who come from that background and that we would not have maybe uncovered. But what ended up happening after a while was we kept getting the same artist names mentioned to us. And so we felt we had reached both saturation and redundancy. So we had a universe of possibilities. I'm sure we missed a lot of really qualified people, but this was one idiosyncratic slice and we did the best we could to provide a, a really broad swath. But we, we made those decisions um, without doing a call for submissions. But then we got um, 100, 100 artists, we narrowed it down to 100. We wrote to them, told them we were considering them for the show. Would they please send us a body, uh, 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 a Dropbox with their images, and uh, you can send up to a hundred images. So, we our Dropbox got very full, and we uh, narrowed that grouping down to 75, and then we went and visited 75 artists in the South. So, we did studio visits. One quick story: one of the artists was an artist named Euphus Ruth. I didn't show you his pictures; they're ex extraordinary wet plate collodion. Um, prints or, or uh, images and um, he's from Mississippi and he was a former he worked for the energy company in Mississippi and retired and photography was kind of a hobby but he, he, he was obsessed about it he it wasn't really a hobby and he was really good and then he retired and he devoted his time full-time to photography but he had never really entertained he's a you know older guy and he really then covered in tattoos and he was in a biker gang and all this stuff Anyway, uh, kind of scary looking guy. My friend Mark Long and I went to his house in Mississippi, which was hard to get to, and GPS kind of gave up on us. But we got there, and he had never had curators to his house before, to his studio. So he, um, he had one, one side of the room. He had tea and coffee and muffins and cookies over on this. And then on the other side of the room, he had whiskey and beer and wine and peanuts and so you know it's like he didn't know so he was he was loaded for bear whatever whatever the curators want I've got so I think his wife helped him with the cookies and teas and stuff so well we uh, I went for the cook I don't drink I went for the cookies and tea and uh, 
muffin side of things, and Mark Long went straight for the whiskey. <laughs> and we had a wonderful uh, studio visit with him and just really enjoyed getting to know him. Uh, really kind and wonderful human being. I believe he's been here or is coming here, Maxine? He's been here a few times, yeah. Any other questions? It's a big project, um, and it was fun to put together. Um, but because you put yourself out there with a project like this, um, it, it we, we made ourselves a big target. I mean, it's uh, if if someone no one fortunately, we didn't get negative press or any of that. But with a project like this, you you can sometimes get that. Uh, so this is all the media attention we got for the project. This is just a listing. We got a really nice spread in The Guardian. And uh, Time Magazine did a feature on it. Garden and Gun Magazine. Um, you can see some of the Burn Away, which is a blog. Um, one of the things we did was we uh, got the, uh, we sent press releases to the hometowns of all the photographers. Isn't that funny? And they almost all wrote articles about their own hometown photographers. Uh, so yeah, so it got, it's gotten a lot of uh, attention, which is great. See, this is one hometown, R Rachel Boyo uh, from the, uh, doesn't say where, it, where it's from, but. Belmont University, I think, uh, their newsletter. And then local photographer participates in regional project, Mebbin Enterprise, you know. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it was a, kind of a whirlwind project. What are the Arkansas Sorry? Um, so this image, I, I, I would like to just quickly point out the, this image here of this young girl walking down the um, road here. That is, that's on the cover of the book and it's on the cover of the website. It became kind of the iconic images, image for the show. It's, it's um, by an artist named Stacy Kranitz and it's a photograph taken in Ile St. Charles in Louisiana. And Ile St. Charles is, an, is the town that you see on the other end where she's walking. And this is a road that leads there that's been washed out. And this is after Katrina. And Katrina came and kind of wiped out the town of Ile St. Charles. And then instead of the water receding, the water stayed in Ile St. Charles. So about a foot and a half to two feet of water stayed in the entire town. I don't know how many, I can't remember how many residents. I, I believe I heard 1,100. And those people all had to be relocated to different cities. And they are the first environmental refugees due to climate change in North America. And so she's walking down the road to get to Ile St. Charles, which you can, you can still get to, but you have to go like this to get there. Um, no vehicles. I mean, you could take a boat, but you can't. Um, so we like the idea she's walking south. That's headed due south, southbound. And we felt this was an ominous and potentially portentous image to represent the project. Uh, it's representing the New South. Not that we're downers or anything, but we thought that that was a, yeah, here we are. So we're, we're realists is what we are. So anyway, anyway, any other questions? If not, yeah? Uh, I thank you so much for your time and attention. Thanks for having me.